Hey friends, and welcome to the Happy Hour with Jamie Ivey podcast. I'm your host, Jamie, and I'm so glad you're here. Each week on this show, I invite a girlfriend to join me and we chat about the big things in life, the little things in life, and everything in between. For a healthy and delicious snack that lets your kids explore, play, and be their best, you've got to try Go Go Squeeze. Go Go Squeeze is made from 100% all natural fruit with no artificial anything, you guys. Nothing but orchard fresh apples and other wholesome fruit, all in a squeezable pouch that's ready to go wherever they go. There's over 25 tasty varieties kids will love, my kids love them, and that you can feel great about too. Go Go Squeeze fruit on the go pouches. Find them in the applesauce aisle today. You guys, you are listening to episode number 180, and my guest is Sonia Overheiser. And our conversation includes basically all my favorite things. Food, they just have a cookbook that released, recipes, love, babies, and adoption. We also dive into how Sonia started to see a connection between the food she was eating and the way that God wants us to take care of our bodies so that we can be our best selves. You guys, I loved how her and her husband began loving to cook. Here's what I learned from this. You guys, we can do this. If they can do it, we can do it. And you guys get ready for some tissues when she shares her story of how she finally became a mama after going through cancer and miscarriage and infertility. You're going to love it. Guys, I want to let you know that today, 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 on Wednesday, February 14th, which by the way, happy Valentine's Day, you guys. Today, the tickets for the next Happy Hour Live went on sale to everyone that is subscribed to my email list. These are my email friends. I let them in on things first. So I sincerely hope that you are on that list and you're able to snag a ticket or two. These events that we do twice a year are hands down, without a doubt, the most fun thing that we do. This event is going to take place out at Green Acres, which is a glamping retreat center that we own with some other friends of ours outside of Austin. The dates are May 4th and May 5th, and I just may possibly be turning 40 on May 6th. So it's going to be a fun weekend. The guests on stage with me this year are phenomenal. The food is always fantastic. The whole entire night is built around this, encouraging every single woman that ventures out to this event with us. You're going to leave fulfilled and you're going to have such a great night. So tickets went out today to the email list. They go on sale to the public on Friday. So be sure you're following me on Instagram, which is at Jamie Ivy, so you can see that on Friday. You guys, here is my conversation with Sonia. Sonia, welcome to the happy hour. Thank you so much for having me, Jamie. I'm glad you're on the show today and you have a great story that I know that my listeners are going to love hearing from you and resonate with. And it's fun for me also to talk to you because you and your husband, Alex, have a passion for cooking. And my husband and I also have a passion for cooking. And from what little I know about you, I think that our passions kind of started about the same way. So you guys, you and your husband also just released your first cookbook last week. Tons of congratulations. Thank you so much. You have a book in public where people are going to buy it and has your name on it. I cannot believe it. <laughs> Doesn't that feel weird? It literally feels like when I see people holding it and looking at recipes, it literally feels like your heart is on a plate and they're like <laughs> just digging into it. Totally. Because we get your cookbook or when people buy people's trade books, we get your cookbook and we're like, oh, this is cool. I'm going to make this recipe. How fun. And you're like, okay, that took weeks to figure out how exactly to do that and then to make the photos and all the things. You put time into that cookbook and we're just going to make a recipe and feed it to our family like it's a normal day. Exactly. <laughs> and you did yeah, so I've much seen, work for that. I've seen some people kind of flip through it and be like, oh, okay, there's a cookbook and it's just like, oh <laughs> man, I've crushed my soul. Oh, So you and Alex, tell me about your love for cooking because I know you've told me before that you didn't always have it. And so where did that come from? Right. So when we we grew up just kind of eating what our families cooked for us, and then we went to college, we actually met the first day of freshman year here at Indiana University. Yeah, real sweet story. <laughs> and um, our diets were just trash at the time. We did, did a lot of fast food, a lot of frozen food. I infamously ate Hot Pockets all the time. <laughs> um, and we just, we didn't, feel the need to get in the kitchen at all. And then we got married. We bought a house and we said, hey, let's have some people over for dinner. And we realized, okay, we can't feed them Hot Pockets or cereal. So we should probably figure something else out. So we got a cookbook 
actually famously one of um, Julia Child's cookbooks came to us through a mutual friend. And uh, when I started reading her book, I was reading the head notes, the little part above the recipe, and she was so encouraging. She would just say, hey, like this sounds really fancy, this omelet or this crepe, but you can do it. And I am proof of it because Julia Child actually started cooking in her 30s. Um, So she was not a lifelong cook. And that was really inspiring to us. And we said, okay, if Julia Child could do it, we certainly could do it. So we tried some recipes. They worked magically, maybe beginner's luck. And then (laughs) that started just kind of growing into a spiral of inviting more friends for dinner and trying new recipes from new cookbooks. I love that so much, especially, you know, you're, I like how you described we're in college, we're eating Hot Pockets and oh my gosh, my 40 year old body, if I ate what I ate when I was in college, I, I would just die right now. Like it would be so awful. Absolutely. Uh, <laughs> but you, we figured out like what worked for us and how to do that. But I think a lot of people start like you do where they go, okay, we're grownups now. <laughs> we need to cook and eat like grownups. Do you remember I don't know if you know this. Do you remember the first meal that you made where you're like, we can do this? You know, I do. I think it was a, a fish recipe actually with a mango salsa. And I have no idea where we found it, maybe online. But I remember having the the savory fish with a like kind of sweet tart mango salsa. And I was like, wow, like I made this myself. This is incredible. (laughs) Because that is a big deal. Because when you don't cook, mango salsa feels like you just slaved in the kitchen. Exactly. (laughs) (laughs) I do love mango salsa a lot. Um, Okay, so tell me this also. When you talk about like getting in the kitchen and cooking with your husband, did you both start doing this together at the same time? Because I know you guys not only, you know, wrote a cookbook together, but you love in cooking together now. And I hear a lot of women say like, I think I would really like that. Did you guys start out cooking together? We did. I'm really lucky in the fact that Alex has been here the entire way. And I think that's the reason that honestly, that I'm still doing it today. He has this really great approach to the kitchen where he doesn't mind failing, where I would rather, you know, everything work out perfectly and we just do the recipe and it works and it's great. He is, he's so good at bouncing back from failure or even like doing recipes, taking risks, knowing he is probably going to fail. He finds that super educational for him, which I think is Uh a really great personality trait. Um, But that was really helpful for me in the beginning because I would make so many things that wouldn't work out or they would just kind of fail my expectations or I might not like them very much. And I would just want to quit all the time. I would say, okay, I can't do it perfect. So I'm just going to quit. And because Alex was there encouraging me saying, okay, that's all right. Let's just try it again tomorrow. Um, I think that's the reason I'm here today with it because I, at the time, um, just really viewed it as, okay, if I'm not good at it, I'm just not going to do it. Because that's how we do a lot of things as well. It's like, if I can't be the best, (laughs) then why would I do anything at all? Which there's a lot of drive to that as well. Now, when, how far into this journey did you guys start blogging about food? So we got married 10 years ago and we started our blog three years into that. So 2010, seven years ago, we started our blog. And around that time, we had a personal blog because everybody had a personal blog in 2010, right? Mm -hmm. And we just kept posting pictures of food and pictures of food. And so we said, okay, maybe we should just have a separate space for just these food pictures and these new recipes that we're trying. And so... We decided to start a food blog and I had been following food blogs for a while. They were only maybe three or four years old at the time, max, maybe three years um, for some of the longer food bloggers. So they had just started. And I remember thinking, these are like professional quality food photographs. And these are like real people that are putting them online. I was just like mystified by it. But reading food blogs was really how I started to learn about food. I would see different foods coming into the season like asparagus in the spring and tomatoes in the late to mid summer here in the Midwest. And and that was kind of how I started to learn about seasonality. And when you make certain recipes was from food blogs. You know, I think there's a lot to say about finding something that you feel as though you have this passion inside of you and then watching people who are ahead of you. I think we could take that and look at that across the board at all kinds of things. 
I know for me, if there's people who are doing something that I think I want to try out or I want to maybe get better at, looking at people who are around you that you think are doing it well is such an inspiration. And I think just now in 2018, you could find anybody on the internet doing anything and learn from them. I mean, it's just like you have this school right in front of you of people who are ready to teach you anything. I know we do that with Instagram and people who post recipes and food on Instagram because it's such a great way to capture people's eyes and their attention and their hearts. Absolutely. Yeah. We would not be doing what we're doing today if we didn't have the ability, like you're saying, to see other people doing things so well at such a high caliber and being able to watch them and try to emulate them and figure out what is it that I like from what they do. And then sometimes reaching out to some of those people and saying, I love what you're doing. You're so inspiring. Um, And then hearing back from them and being able to form a relationship and then kind of help each other along the way. That has been key in our ability to grow our blog and then also to write this book. And I think that sometimes we can look at people around us who are doing things, quote unquote, better than us and just think, oh, they have everything together. I'll never be like that. Instead of viewing it the way that you and I are talking about of like, man, how can I learn from them? Like, what can I look at them and say, I'm going to, they're going to help me be better at fill in the blank. And that's a way that I think we can use our little online social media in a healthy way. Now, I want to talk to you about this because you guys don't just create recipes that are just run of the mill. You focus on healthy recipes and your book is a vegetarian cookbook, isn't it? It is. Have you always been vegetarian? No, not at all. And me of 15 years ago would laugh, I think, to to know that I was writing a vegetarian cookbook. Um, No, we have not always been vegetarian. But when we started cooking together back when we got married and bought our little house, we read a book called Food Matters by Mark Bittman. Uh And in it, he talks about just embracing eating a lot of from scratch meals at home, eating less processed foods and then eating more vegetables. And he didn't say, okay, go out and be a vegetarian or go out and be a vegan. He just said, start eating more vegetarian meals. And so for us, that was really helpful to have a baby step to start with. So we said, okay, let's try one vegetarian meal one time a week. And then we found it was really delicious and we loved it. So we said, okay, let's do it two times a week. And then we just started doing it more and more. And today we're not 100% vegetarian, but most of what we cook at home is vegetarian. And then typically for special occasions or vacations or having people over, then we'll um, have meat or seafood. We used to be vegetarians. We're not anymore. And I think a lot of people would be so scared by vegetarian. They're like, what do you mean? how can you not eat meat? And it just seems like this concept to some people that is so foreign and so crazy. But yet when you're in it, I'm just like, well, we just eat a lot of other stuff. Like we eat plenty of great, amazing food. And so I'm excited to try your recipes because we don't cook a lot of meat at our house. We're not vegetarians by any means, but we just don't cook a lot of meat um, for a couple of reasons. Number one, there's a lot of people in this house. And so it's cheaper (laughs) if we don't do meat. Um, And then second, we just find that we can get a lot more veggies in our kids if that is the main dish that we're offering, you know, is more plant-based diet. So we like that kind of meal. Gosh, I'm excited about your book. Oh yeah. I mean, I think when we started eating vegetarian, my mind was just open to this whole new world of eating creatively. And I think my life has been much more delicious because I've had these kind of creative parameters of like, okay, try to make a meal without meat. And because we have those parameters, I think it makes for a lot more creative and delicious eating. Oh, now I'm going to be hungry because I'm going to be thinking about all the creative foods that we could make being a vegetarian. Um, now, I know that you, this can be like a touchy subject, what I'm about to ask you about. And so I'm excited to hear your thoughts about it. But you actually said to me that your approach to your lifestyle change has been affected by your faith. And so, and when I say touchy, I mean, it's not that big touchy, but I'm assuming by what you're going to say, some people could be like, what do you mean my faith needs to be like my food and my faith can go together? Right. But when you look about like our bodies and the way we take care of them and the food that we input into them, you can make a case that your faith can affect the food that you put in your body. And so how does your journey look like with that? Absolutely. I mean, I've God has commanded us to take care of our bodies, right? And to take care of other people and to take care of this beautiful creation that he's given us. And I think 
um, once I started kind of embracing all the different beautiful produce that he has put into this world, it was like a light bulb of like, oh yeah, like he, he wants us to take care of this earth so we can continue to have these amazing and beautiful things to eat and nourish our bodies. And he wants us to take care of our bodies so that we can be our best selves in order to take care of other people. And then also I'm um, just thinking about the sourcing of food and how the workers are treated who are creating this food and the farmers. And, you know, once you dig into the backstory of food, there's this whole new world opens up of, you know, how is the food grown and who are the people who are creating it? And also the way that it, it, connects our communities together and the way that you can, you know, show kindness to a stranger or reach out to someone um, and tell them about your faith over a shared meal together, that a meal creates empathy and a sense of community when you share it with someone. So there are all these, you know, obviously examples in the Bible of people sharing meals together and it just kind of food kind of brings all those things together for us. It does. I love hearing conversations that happen around meals and dinner tables. When you invite people into your home, it's one thing, but when you invite people in your home and you serve them a meal and you sit around the table, it's like change can happen and walls can fall down and people become open with their stories. And so it is such a great time to be able to share uh, your faith with people as well. Um, what did you serve your last people you had over for dinner? Oh gosh, good question. So actually the last people I had over were for lunch. My nephews came over and my mother-in-law and my sister-in-law and I made them our creamy vegan tomato soup oh my and gosh. grilled cheese dippers. So it was a little bit of a kid-centric meal. That sounds good. And there's, they're honestly the best meals in the world on one hand. I think that you'd have to throw in their tomato soup and grilled cheese. Like exactly. It's just one of the best, one of the best. All right, guys, I know that you're loving this conversation with Sonia and we're about to get into some really good stuff. But first, I want to thank two of our sponsors for today's show. And you know what? I love both of these sponsors and they're both going to help your life be easier. Okay, first, I want to thank Wink. That is W-I-N-C, Wink. Here's the deal, guys. Wink makes it easy to discover great wine. They've helped us at the Ivy House discover great wine because I went online and filled out their Wink's palette profile quiz and I answered simple questions that, you know, the average person is not gonna know. Questions like, how do you take your coffee and how do you feel about blueberries? And then their wine experts select wines that are matched to your taste, personalized just for you, shipped right to your door and starting at just $13 a bottle. You guys, there's basically nothing better than coming home to a box of delicious Wink wine that was selected just for you. It just might turn out to be the best day of your month. Each month, there are new delicious wines like the insanely popular Summer Water Rosé. Here's some of the best things you need to know as well. Guys, no membership fees. You can skip it any month and cancel any time. Shipping is covered, and if you don't like a bottle they send to you, they're going to replace it with a bottle that you love, no questions asked. Guys, you can discover great wine for yourself today. Go to trywink.com slash happy. That's try, T-R-Y, and then wink, W-I-N-C, dot com slash happy, and you're going to get $20 off your first shipment. Trywink.com slash happy. Guys, another support for today's show comes from Prep Dish. And Prep Dish is a healthy subscription based meal planning service. So here's what you need to know is life is crazy. If you have a crazy schedule, I have a crazy schedule. This is going to save you time. No more thinking about your meals, you guys. You're gonna let Prep Dish do the planning for you. Sign up and you're gonna receive an email with a grocery list, prep ahead instructions. So all your meals are ready for the week. So you guys, you get your list. You go to the grocery store, you buy your groceries, you come home, you prep your meals ahead of time, and then the rest of the week you're set. It is the best thing. Any mom is out there about to get into baseball season, I know what that feels like. Prep dish meals are healthy, gluten-free, dairy-free, and paleo meals. It's basically just real food, you guys. You're gonna save time and have amazingly delicious meals like smoky paprika chicken legs with a trio of roasted vegetables or turkey and zucchini lasagna. I could go for some turkey and zucchini lasagna right now. Basically, they're going to take the guesswork out of dinner. Right now, Allison, the founder of Prep Dish, is offering you a month-long trial for $4. That's right, you guys. You get to try this out for only a dollar per week. 
you cannot get a cup of coffee for a dollar, you guys. This is basically a no-brainer. Go to PrepDish.com slash happy hour for this amazing deal. Again, that's PrepDish.com slash happy hour to try your first month of PrepDish for only $4. All right, guys, we're going to get back to the show. I just want to remind you, when you hear these people that sponsor the show, if you want to know more information, go to my webpage, jamieivy.com, find the show notes for this show, and we're going to have links for you. So we'll always let you know what's happening. Okay, here is the rest of my conversation with Sonia. Sonia, I want to switch gears a little bit. And I know that you guys have a sweet new baby. Well, we well, t- t- almost a year old. He is. Yeah, he's he's 11 months. So his birthday is coming up very soon. Oh my goodness. You're about to have a one-year-old. Which to me, is he walking? He's so close. Okay. He's, he's doing the cruising thing where he's uh-huh. grabbing onto everything. And yeah. Oh my goodness. It's been a long time since I had a little toddling baby in my house, but a lot of my friends are still having babies. And so I get the baby fixed that way. So you almost have a one-year-old, but your journey towards parenthood has not been an easy one. No, it has been long and winding. Um, It kind of started out when I was diagnosed with cancer seven years ago. Um, I have a rare form of leukemia. It's called CML. And the great thing about this form of cancer is that it has a miracle cure. So I actually have a pill that I take once a day and it really was a miracle cure. It cured me within several months. All my symptoms went away and I've been stable ever since. Uh, wow. I, yeah, it's, it's incredible. Okay, so I wanna ask this real quick. How old were you when you found out you had leukemia? Uh, I was 27. Okay. So you found out, but then they said, did they know right away that they had this pill that you could take? They were pretty certain. And that is what has really shaped my cancer journey is, you know, when I got that phone call that said, we think you have leukemia, I was like, oh my gosh. But they follow that up with, but we think it's the good kind. We think it's the one that can be cured by this miracle Mm -hmm. drug. So for me, the cancer diagnosis was always a good one, a good outlook. And so that's been, it's made my cancer journey very different from a lot of other people in my life and people I know about um, who haven't had that hope. I mean, this this cure, um, I don't have to do chemo. I didn't have to do chemo at all. I just did not have many physical symptoms or side effects to this medicine. Wow. I mean, that is just, I've never even heard of that before. Um, Were you married already? Yes, I was married. Okay. So how, when you talk about getting that cancer diagnosis and then, you know, but good news is it's the kind that has a cure. How did that affect your journey towards parenthood? Yeah. So it's funny. I talk about how with this miracle cure, this cancer has had a very minimal effect on my life, except for my parenthood journey. So I went on the medicine, everything was good, but my doctor said, because you're on this pill and it's not tested to see if you could actually get pregnant on it and it's safe um, because we can't do medical research in that realm. It's not ethical you would have to go off your medicine for a brief amount of time to try to get pregnant. And he said, I'm, I'm comfortable with this. It's a little bit risky, but I'm comfortable with it. If you are under control for about three to four years, we can go off the medicine and you can try to get pregnant. I said, okay, that sounds good. So um, I was stable for the three to four years. And then I went off my pill. And um, from the limited research there is about this rare disease, in some cases, the cancer comes back if you go off the pill. And in some cases, it doesn't for quite a long time. And so we just knew, okay, we're going to have to get pregnant really fast and then go right back on the pill. So no pressure, right? Right. (laughs) None at all. So we set about to, to get pregnant And um, it definitely was a lot harder than we thought it would be. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, we thought, okay, because of, you know, I have these health issues, perhaps this journey will be a little harder than we expected. But I think it (laughs) turned out to be even more difficult than we were planning on. Um, After months and months, we were still not pregnant. So the doctors told us to try some fertility treatments just to try to keep, get some things going because of our special circumstance. So we did some fertility treatments 
and did several rounds of those and ended up actually getting pregnant for eight weeks and then had a miscarriage. And mm, I'm sorry. Yeah, thank you. It was incredibly devastating. Um, not only because of what happened, but just because in my heart, I knew, okay, I think that might be the one time that I'll be able to mm. be pregnant. Okay. So you, you had this feeling of this is going to be the only time. Why do you think you felt that? I'm not sure. I don't know if it was, you know, God telling me that the, to prepare your heart or if I was just feeling fatalistic. I don't know, but I, I think yeah, I, yeah. I just had this premonition that, that it, mm -hmm. it might be really the only chance that I will have to be pregnant. So you, at eight weeks, you um, experienced a miscarriage and walked through that loss. And then were you guys thinking, okay, well, let's, let's try again. Or were your doctors concerned? Yeah. So we decided to try again and um, a few months went by kind of recovering from the miscarriage. And then my cancer started coming back. And the way that my cancer comes back is my white blood cell count starts to increase and so every week I would go in for a checkup and I would have my numbers would be up higher. And um, I had prayer warriors all over the country um, just praying that God would get, give us more time. And mm -hmm. um, just every week I would go in and it would be higher. And so my doctor said, hey, there's this other cancer drug that's safe to get pregnant on, but it's a shot and it will give you flu-like symptoms. It will really decrease your energy, but you can try it as the last ditch resort. And so I said, okay, let's go. I mean, we've, we've made it this far. Right. Why don't we just keep trying? And I think that's where a lot of people feel when they start going down this path of fertility treatments and trying, um, you, you get so far and then you say, well, if I'm this far, I might as well just take another yeah, step, right? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And so you started these treatments, which when you're saying you're, what it's going to give you the symptoms of, I'm like, golly, that could sound like what some people's extreme morning sickness might feel like. So how long were you on, the, on that shot? You know, my memory is a little blurry of this phase of my life. I think it was probably three or four months. And um, this is probably the darkest time of my life. I was, you know, trying so hard to get pregnant, praying so hard, taking a pregnancy test all the time, you know, praying mm -hmm. when you take the test and then waiting that minute or however long it yeah. takes. I'm um, just uh -huh. like pleading, you know, bargaining with God, like, you know, if, if, if I'm pregnant, I'll cut off my right arm if you want me to. <laughs> right. Whatever, you know? whatever. Yeah. yeah. And uh, so I had that going on and then these flu like symptoms, I would, you know, I would inject myself and then get the flu and then feel really terrible. And I was working full time and, you know, writing a food blog and doing all these other things. And then just having this, this emptiness, you know, and, just searching it, trying to hear what I felt like God wanted. You know, I, f I felt like, God, if you just tell me to adopt, then I'll do it. But, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't hearing that. And so um, we were just, just kept trying and kept praying. And my blood cells actually, they, because they were getting so high, they were in my spleen and making my spleen grow. So half my body was oh. taken over by my spleen. Oh my and gosh. at one point, Alex just sat me down and was like, I don't think we should do this anymore. Like this has gotten oh. too far. I'm worried about your health. And right. you know, we had to right. make that decision of, okay, mm. I think that we Time will to stop. never have biological children. Mm. So I can imagine that feeling. And I know that there are listeners who have walked down this road, maybe not the same way with cancer diagnosis, but with those same ideas. And it might not even be with, you know, bearing children, but it could just be, this is just not how my life is going to be. And it's not the way I thought it would be. I think we all have this idealistic idea of how life should look. And when it doesn't look that way, there are many times when we can say, this isn't fair. This is not what I wanted. And you said this was one of the darkest seasons did your faith ever waver during that time? 
Yes and no. In some ways, I was just kind of all I had was my faith of just grasping to this belief that God had a plan for our family. But then Mm. also, because I wasn't hearing um, direction, I just felt kind of empty, you know? And I wonder if some of your listeners have been in that place too, of just feeling like, okay, God, I know you're working, but I can't see it. And that makes it so hard for me to like, to understand the full picture of what you're doing. Yeah. Yeah. And then even this could be too much information. If it is, we don't need to leave it in here, but I'm thinking about, I've had friends who've walked through infertility and just the idea of the intimacy that it takes to make a baby verse. And then on top of that, you're like, it's, it's kind of this different idea because now you had this like goal in mind of we need to make a baby, make a baby, make a baby. And then on top of that, you're feeling sick, you know? And if you're married, you know that feeling like the flu is not a time you want to spend time with your husband in the bed. How was your relationship with your husband in that time? Yeah, it was, it was really, really tough. But Alex is incredible. He's the most supportive person that I've ever met. All right, now I'm crying. Um, And I mean, he walked every day with me. And um, yeah, I mean, I I couldn't have done it without him. And yeah, um, yeah, he was incredible. So in some ways, I think the situation could have made us further apart. But because we were each going through the same thing together and he was right there with me, I think it grew us closer together. Yeah. Oh, I I'm, I'm think that God is so kind um, in the ways that he can bring marriages closer, even when it's not exactly the way that we would think that we would like to go through to be closer. So you end up, Alex says, you know what, Sonia, I think that we're going to need to stop this. This is, it's hurting your body. Your spleen is taking you over. And you decided to stop. And then did you feel, did you hear that God wanted you guys to pursue adoption then? No, (laughs) still no. Still no. (laughs) And that's what made it really difficult. Um, Alex did. I mean, he was like, okay, I think Mm. adoption is, is the path that we want to, I want to pursue. And that actually was probably the one time through the whole process that we weren't on the same page because I just was not sure Mm -hmm. adoption wasn't something that had been on my radar. I knew a lot of people who had always wanted to adopt and then had, and, and then I'd, I'd known other people who that had been part of their journey later on. But for whatever reason, my head was thinking, okay, I, I just didn't imagine that for myself. So it took quite a while for me to come on board with the idea. Maybe quite a while. It's just like a month, but um, yeah. it, it really... Yeah. It really felt like a foreign idea to me for some reason. And because I had had direction from God in other ways in my life, I do feel like he told me, write a cookbook. (laughs) Um, But I didn't feel like he said, pursue adoption. And so that was really tough for me as I was seeking what his will was for our family um, to just to, to trust him, but not to hear those words. And so I found that because I felt like Alex was really pursuing the adoption idea that I would have to just trust that God was was leading him in the way he wanted us to go. Mm-hmm. You 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 speak of this time of not knowing and not hearing um and you've had this in other times in your life. Um you call it something. What do you call that? It's called the liminal space. Liminal. I've never heard that before. Is this something you made up or can you educate me? No, I'm not that I'm not that smart. Uh, no. So it's a term in both in psychology and apparently in literature, I found as I was Google searching liminal space. And what it is is a time where nothing is happening, like in the plot of a novel or a play. It's the time between the major events. And I found that also in psychology, it applies to our own lives. So the time where nothing is happening. (laughs) And I felt like, oh man, like this is the time in my life where I'm in the liminal space. I have no idea where my family is going to come from. I've been waiting for years to figure it out. And we're just sitting here waiting for something to happen. And 
for whatever reason, just labeling that time as the liminal space was incredibly helpful for me to say, okay, now I know. Now I know, God, what season I'm in. It's the liminal space. Which is a scary space, I feel like. I mean, maybe it's for people who are like control freaks like me that I need to know what's happening. And if I don't know, it's scary. I mean, aren't all of us control freaks? (laughs) in a way or another. (laughs) Did you look up this phrase in the midst of that or after? I did in the midst. So a friend of mine mentioned she had heard about it. And then I looked it up and I said, oh man, liminal space right now. I'm in it. See, because I think that's interesting because I think a lot of times we can look back and be like, oh, that time I was in that. But you actually investigated it and felt it so deeply in your soul that you're like, something's not I'm going to use quote unquote right here because I'm not saying it wasn't right, Right. but you just felt as though something was off here um, and you looked up and figured it out. And I think that, man, when you're talking about that, I can think of seasons in my own life that would probably feel that way. And I can think of people who are probably in those seasons right now. What helped you endure that time? Yeah. So first of all, labeling it (laughs) to realize Uh this is what I'm going through. Um, And then bringing in community. I mean, I had so many amazing friends checking in on me, praying for me, saying, let's do coffee. And that was really, really helpful for me. And there were days, honestly, like introvert days. (laughs) I'm an extrovert, but I have introvert days. And there are some days when you're going through grief and pain where you just want to be alone. And I took those, but There were a lot of other days where I wanted to be with friends and especially talk to people who had been through similar situations. So I think surrounding yourself with a supportive community and even reaching out to people in your own circles, even though it's so hard when you're in that to ask for help, just to connect with others. So, so helpful for me. Totally. And you said something key there is that you had to reach out and tell people, you know, you had to let them in or else no one would know. I mean, I feel like when you're in a situation like that, when you're in your darkest hour, the last thing you want to do is reach out and say, I need help. You want everyone else to read your mind. (laughs) And you just want to sit on the couch and kind of veg out and, you know, let your thoughts kind of take over. Um, Okay. So you're feeling like you're in the space. Alex is saying, I think that adoption is something that we should pursue you're kind of not feeling it. And then about a month in, you kind of trust his leadership in that. And then you start the adoption process. And, you know, just a month later, you brought oh, home yeah. your baby, right? Right. So easy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So what was that road? Because I know myself having three children through adoption is that it is a hard road to get to your baby. So what did that look like for you guys? Yeah. So we knew going in, it could be a hard road again. So, um, but we did not expect what what was in store for us. So we signed on, we did all our paperwork. We were really, you know, type A about it, do it really fast. Um, and then we just started waiting. And again, liminal space, just waiting for something to happen. Right. And after several months, we got matched with a birth mom and she was in our city and we met with her and she said, I want you to have my baby. And we were like, oh my gosh. And she was due in a couple of weeks and she gave me an ultrasound picture and we started texting. And then a couple of days before her due date, she just went incommunicado, no more messages. And every day we would say, oh my gosh, like, is this our baby? Is this not our baby? And we finally found out that she had the baby and decided to parent. So Mm -hmm. it was soul crushing, but it was also, I mean, you cannot fault a mother for wanting to parent her child. Mm -hmm. So we totally understood, but we were also totally devastated. And that's such a hard place to be in. Uh, We fortunately did not walk through um, that kind of situation, but I have other friends that have. And Amanda Jones was on the show once before and talked about walking through this. And it is this, it's this feeling that you don't know how to explain because you know, you know that she has every right to make that choice. And if it was you, you would make it and all the, you know, all the right things, you know, yes. you know that you're happy for this mother and child who get to be together. But on the other hand, your heart was so prepared to be a mama. And so you then have to experience, you grieve that loss that it's weird because you never had it, you know? And so I don't think people can understand that unless they've been through it. And it is real. It is real, that grieving that you went through. Okay. So 
you're grieving that loss. And then when did you get back into the game per se with being ready to be open to another birth mom? Right. So we were ready pretty much right away. And so we actually got another match within a month or two. I'm trying to remember about a month. Um, and we're matched with her. Everything was going great. And then it happened again. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So same kind of scenario, like lose contact and all that kind of stuff. uh, So she had decided she wanted to be with a baby for one day in the hospital before we arrived. And our agency said that makes us nervous, but we cannot force the mom into anything. And so we have to respect her wishes. And so then they called us. We were all ready. We had our bags packed, everything. Um, And it was a Friday night. I remember I was at work at my office job and they called at like 5 p.m. on the Friday and said, it's not going to happen. And I was crushing. Yep. 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 Not again. And then you go into the weekend and you grieve and you cry. And then are you back in the game again? Yeah. 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 Right back into it. Yep. (laughs) Yep. So the next one, um, I really thought this is our baby. We actually got what Mm -hmm. our agency calls is a fall in your lap baby. So the baby was born. She's in the hospital a couple hours away and the birth mother wanted to pursue adoption her boyfriend thought the baby was his. So he wanted a family to take this baby for a week so they could do a paternity test and decide whose baby it was. If it was his, they would keep it. If it was not his, the adopted family Mm. would keep it. Adoptive family would keep the baby. So they said, are you guys up for this? And Mm -hmm. I said, yes, Mm -hmm. this is our baby. I'm pretty sure (laughs) this is the one. And so we actually took home a new right. Uh-huh. She, we were technically fostering her. Um, the adopted adoption agency had custody at that point, um, but we had her in her home, and we were just, you know, praying and, like I said, the bargaining. I think it's just human nature to be like, right. do anything. Of course it is. <laughs> yes, yes. You help me, I'll help you. Yes, exactly. And so. Um, yeah, it was a week of just constant praying, hoping, and ended up that it was his baby and they took him back, her back. So mm. that was the most difficult situation because it almost, at that point, it was almost laughable. It was like, really? Like mm-hmm. there was a baby in our home and, and then now she had to go not. away. Um, so it was, it, it almost became kind of surprising. And when I tell the story again, sometimes I'm like, was that real? (laughs) Right. Did I really have a baby girl for a week? Yeah. Right. Now, when you're telling about these three placements and non-placements, how many months, was this in a span of a couple months, a year? What are we talking here? Yeah, we were active about a year and all of these happened within the last about six months or so. Okay. 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 So this has got to be devastating. And are you guys ever thinking, I can't do this again. I can't put my heart out again. I just, we're, I don't know what we're going to do, but we can't do this. Yes, (laughs) absolutely. Both of you or just you? Um, more me. I think, like I said, I'm the one who's like, oh, it's not working out. Let's try something else. Yeah. (laughs) Right. Right. Eject, new plan. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. So did you have those conversations with Alex of just, I can't do this again? Yes. Um, he, I think he's a lot, he, he really had the faith of, you know, if, if we stay in the game, that's what he kept telling me. If we stay in the game long enough, there will be a baby. The adoption agency has promised that's that's what mm-hmm. happens and yeah he was he was pretty logical about it um a lot more than i was i guess yeah yeah and then how what happens next so yeah so we recover from that um we get a call a couple about a month and a half later that there's a birth mother who has chosen us and she is due in february and at this point, you know, we're just guarding our hearts, right? We're like, For sure, okay, 100%. that's fine, whatever. <laughs> right. Exactly, exactly. I'll believe it when it's true, all the things, yep. yeah. 
So we just kind of tried not to think about it. We met with the birth mother. Her name is Mariah. We met with her twice. And on in one sense, it's really exciting to meet with someone. On, in the other sense, it's really awkward, right? To like sit mm-hmm. down at a chain restaurant and be like, hey, do you want to parent my child? Sure, I would love right. to. You know, it's just like... It's, it's, it's you can't even explain yeah. the awkward. Yes. Yes. So there were a lot of tears. She was very emotional about it, but she had her mind made up and she knew about our story. We told her we were very honest about what had happened and she was very sympathetic to that. And we found out through the process that her grandmother adopted her mother. So her grandmother actually told us later on that she had told Mariah you know, if you're going to do this, you have to decide and you have to stay strong because I know what it's like to be an adoptive mother. So that was really interesting to have someone in her family Mm. who had gone through the process too. Yeah. Yeah. On the other side. Yeah. So we are matched with her for several months and this was actually during the time we were writing our book. So we had our heads down. (laughs) We were invested in writing this book photographing these 100 recipes and our book was due March 1st and we got a call on February 19th that Mariah was in the hospital and okay second time of tears (laughs) Um, I was sitting at my desk where I'm sitting right now drinking some coffee working on the manuscript And we got the call and I was just like frozen. I didn't know what to do. Alex was like, pack a bag. Come on, we have to go. I was like, what, what, what? And uh, we rushed to the hospital and um, Mariah said that I could be in the room with her, which was really special. And I got Mm -hmm. to see our son Larson come into the world. And it was the most incredible moment of my life. And, oh. um, you know, right. I, uh-huh. And, um, we had then three days in the hospital, actually two days in the hospital waiting for her to sign the papers. And it was just a really sweet time of the four of us spending together with baby Larson. And at the end of those days, we sat in our hospital room and waited for her to sign the papers. And that was one of the most excruciating moments of my life. I was sweating Mm -hmm. and just watching the clock and saying, please, Lord, let this be our baby. And the social worker came in and said, it's a boy. It's, it's Mm -hmm. this boy is your son. And, um, we just, I just, you know, tears gushed and we signed the papers and brought home our baby boy. Oh, now you're going (laughs) to make me cry over here. Uh, gosh, so many emotions. And, you know, it's a year later. And so you're looking back a year ago is when you walked through this and it's so fresh and familiar to your brain and your heart. Spending those days in the hospital with Mariah and Larson, I can imagine they were full of moments where you thought, I'm either making amazing memories to share with my son one day, or these are going to be the most painful yes. memories. Yes. So how did you, you know, that that is not the same as this liminal space because a lot is happening and you're probably trying to, you want to embrace it. You want to be there fully. You want to enjoy every moment. But I can only imagine that you're also guarding your heart, guarding your heart. How did you find, how did you handle both of those emotions being so strong? I don't even know. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, were they, am oh, I right? Were, were they both so strong? Absolutely right. It was so, so hard. And, you know, she would, Mariah was amazing. She would tell the nurse that, or the nurses would ask a question of like, what should I do with this or that with the baby? And she would say, ask his parents, they're right here. And I would be like, oh, Mm. oh my gosh. But then, you know, I'd go to bed and be like, oh my gosh, what if, you know, what if she has a dream tonight that she's supposed to keep him or, you know, like there's, there's no telling what could happen. And so it was like, the most, you know, hyped up on nerves, caffeine, <laughs> um, just everything uh, for those three days. But um, she was, she was amazing and sweet. 
And one night we ordered Chinese food and watched a movie with her and Larson. And it was just like, this is incredible. Mm. I remember our son, um, we have one child that we adopted domestically. And I remember um, meeting his um, birth mom, his first mom in the hospital. And she had originally said she didn't want to meet us. And then the next day, crazy story. My husband was on a tour. And so he flew in for the birth and flew out the next morning and was coming back like the next day. So he flies out the next morning. And so there I am. It's just me and this baby that like, I'll cry now too, because I remember those emotions of thinking, I love this kid so much, but this isn't my kid yet. And do I want to keep loving him or do I want to pull back? And I remember I was hanging out with my son there in the nursery and they came and said, she wants to meet you. And we wanted to meet her so desperately. I mean, it was so important to us. And she had originally said no. And so I remember sitting in her hospital bed and she had delivered what could potentially be my son the day before and meeting her. It was the most awkward interaction I've ever had in my entire life because I just didn't know what to say. You know what I mean? It's like so foreign and so crazy. But I also just remember those feelings of I'm going to love him until someone says I can't, whether that's when I die and he's, you know, 60 or tomorrow when she decides to parent him. And I remember she, obviously he's my son. And so she decided to place him. And the day after we all left the hospital, before we left to go back home, she said she wanted to spend the whole day with us. And Sonia, I remember in that day thinking, I want to learn everything I can about her because I want to be able to tell him one day. And this was, it was such a special day for our family. And so when you're talking about you guys, like watching a movie and eating, it's this weird thing that you can't explain the feelings unless you've been through it. But I get what you're saying. I get where you're thinking, this is something really, really almost more special than anything we'll ever know. And, and so I'm glad you guys had those moments with her for sure. I couldn't agree more. And I feel like you, I mean, you become family that day, right? With your birth mom. Yeah, and totally. You have this like sisterly, motherly, in my case, I'm the same age as her mother, um, yeah. just love towards this person who is giving yeah. you the greatest gift you could ever receive. And for us, I we always feel like, I mean, we have pictures of all of our kids' moms in their rooms because we're just like, man, this, this, you had another mom before me. Like, it's just, it is what it is. This is the truth. Um, and we value them so much um, because they brought you into this world. You know, you have life because of her. And so it's super, super special to us. So now Larson is almost a year. Yes. Oh my goodness. <laughs> I cannot believe it. I'm sure that you're just like, this is so crazy. Um, okay. So I am so excited about your cookbook. I think that I haven't seen it, but I can imagine with the way that you've looked at cooking and the way that you learned cooking, that it's going to be something that people can pick up and just enjoy visually and also be able to jump into the recipes. And that's what I think that you guys are kind of champion people to do. That's what we're all about. We love creating something that's beautiful, that's creative, but it's also something that people will actually eat and make. And that's really important to us. There are a lot of books out there that are maybe a little more aspirational for more advanced cooks. And we would maybe love to write one of those someday, but our heart is equipping people to make stuff in their own kitchen that tastes really good and that nourishes their families. And so that's always been the balance for us in our recipes when we create them. We think so hard <laughs> about the balance of, okay, this will taste good, but that might not be practical for someone. So um, it's every right. day. <laughs> right. You think, just make your cookbook for me, Sonia. And that's how you know you're, you're hitting your target <laughs> audience. If Jamie can do it, then you're good. Uh, okay, so your book already came out. Everyone can go find it. Here's what I always ask my guests before we finish. What three things are you loving and what are you reading? All right, well... Three things I'm loving. So right now, one thing I'm loving in the middle of winter is we're very into, okay, Alex is very into <laughs> indoor plants. Oh, this <laughs> is great. Do you know the Monstera? Do you know what Monstera is? No, I do not. Okay. It's this really beautiful plant. You've probably seen it. It's all over Instagram and Pinterest, okay. um, but the leaves look kind of like jungly and they have a few holes in them. I'll send you a picture of it after. Okay. Yes. And um, they're really stylish, but they're also really easy to grow. And Alex has been growing them. We started with two plants. I think he said that they created like 20 that he's given away to friends. So they're so awesome. So this is the kind of plant where you can clip it and replant it? Yes. 
Oh, I like it. See, Kat Harris was on the show recently and her, one of the things she's loving was plants. And I looked around my office and I'm like, I have no plants in here. So I need to make that change. And you're encouraging me again that I need you to make that change. Most, Sarah. I yeah. know. Okay. So plants, what else are you loving? Okay. Um, next, have you used, or do you know of Asana? Tell me more. Okay. So it is this free software app for managing your to-do list. Yes. And it's perfect for Alex and I because we run a business together. So we're always like emailing each other. Can you do this? Can you do that? And Alex recently said, hey, do you want to try Asana? And typically he he's like always ahead of the curve, knows all the like newest technology. So I'm surprised we hadn't been using it before, but we started using it. And it's just this big task list and you can assign to people like I can assign things to him. He can assign it to me. We can change the due dates and then we can check that magical green check mark to say it's done, which feels so good. Um, so it's really helped us to be able to manage our to-dos together. I used to just manage it in the email and it was getting a little bit insane, especially with a book launch and all the things yeah. that are associated totally. with that, yes. as I'm sure you can understand. So. Yes. Yes. Okay. I think I have heard of it, but I think I've been saying it wrong because I thought it was Asana. You know what? I don't know if I'm saying it right either. So <laughs> we should check with someone on that. Tomato, tomato, yeah. Asana, whatever. Yeah. Okay. So what else? I have used that before, by the way, and it's a great way to keep, do your to-dos. Awesome. Yeah. So last one is Google Home or if you have Alexa, but there, there's a Google Home Mini that's out right now. So we're a Google household. Okay. Everyone's always surprised. They're like, what? We thought that as a creatives, you would use Apple products, but nope, we're a Google right. household. Alex is a Google fanboy. And so he's got us a bunch of these Google Homes and they're really, the mini ones are pretty reasonably priced and they're small and they're like kind of fuzzy. And we just have them in different rooms so we can play music. Larson loves asking them like, what does a dog say? And it barks at him and he thinks it's so <laughs> awesome. <laughs> but then we can just like turn on his music in any room and that type of thing. And then of course, when we're cooking, we're always asking it questions like set a timer for me or yes. that kind of thing. So yes. Okay. We have um, Alexa. Okay. I'm thinking it's the same kind of yep. thing. Yes. Which is so helpful for so many things. Absolutely. Um, okay. What are you reading? Are you a reader? I am a reader and I actually, I'm in a book club. Shout out to my book club. Love book club. <laughs> and it's actually a co-ed book club. So people think it's funny for some reason that Alex and I are in the same book club. Is that, is that funny or is that a normal thing? Well, you know, I've actually, I, I'm not calling it funny by any means, but I've actually never heard of men in a book club. Yeah. We've now, got two guys. I know it happens. Like, I know it happens, obviously. <laughs> But all the book clubs I've ever been a part of, and I think stereotypically, you think, oh, women. Right. Right. No, we've, okay. got, we've got guys. And it's all about fiction books. So uh -huh. actually, the last one we read was Handmaid's Tale. <gasps> Are you watching the show? I have not yet. Have you read it? Are you going to? Have you read it or watched the show? So I haven't read it, but I have a friend that has. But I watched the whole okay. show. And just disclaimer, I always have to do disclaimers do your research and see if you need to watch right. it. Okay. There's right. that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> People like to say disturbing. Uh, <laughs> yeah. it could be a good Yes. Yes. And I don't know. I would be interested if you do watch the show, I would love to hear how it compares with the book and how they handled some of the things in the book. Yeah. I think that I, I've had some friends who are in my book club who watched it and they do like it, but there are actually a, quite a bit of differences. So it's pretty interesting to see how they handled the different parts of the book. I don't want to give any spoiler alerts, but yeah. I also heard that the book ends where season one ends. Yes. And I heard there's a season two. So we were all very fascinated to hear that. And how are they going to go along with the story now. Yeah, exactly. Because there's no story, you know, then now it's going to be all new material, I'm assuming. Right. We heard the author, Margaret Atwood, is going to consult on season two. So hopefully it'll have a Stay similar true, creative yeah. vision to the first season. Yeah. Okay. Well, good. Handmaid's Tale. Um, what are you reading next in your book club? Well, we are reading a novel called Sourdough. Okay. I haven't heard of that. Yeah, I'm I'm halfway in and it's interesting. It's a little bit futuristic um, and I'm not quite sure what I think about it yet, but it is about baking bread and it got Alex really into baking bread. So um, uh, that, well, that is a good outcome. I know. 
I'll take that yep. any day. Maybe I need to give Aaron that book sourdough and see if he starts making more bread. Yeah. Oh, oh man. And Aaron makes like homemade pizza dough. Like I love that kind of stuff in my life. So this is good. He sounds pretty amazing. He's pretty amazing. I'll quit bragging <laughs> on him. He's amazing in the kitchen. It's fun. Um, okay. Well, I like your book club choices and man, I just want to say thank you for coming on and sharing your story with um, your cancer and infertility and writing a cookbook and everything that you and Alex are doing and your sweet baby boy. And so I'm cheering you on here from Austin and I'm excited about your cookbook and people making your recipes in their home. Doesn't that seem weird? But I mean, it's just <laughs> yes. so fun. So fun. <laughs> Terrifying, but exciting. Yes. Well, Sonia, thanks for coming on the happy hour. Jamie, thank you so much for having me. It's been a blast. Guys, don't forget, for a healthy and delicious snack that lets your kids explore, play, and be their best, you have got to try Go-Go Squeeze. Go-Go Squeeze is made from 100% all-natural fruit with no artificial anything, you guys. Nothing but orchard fresh apples and other wholesome fruit, all in a squeezable pouch that's ready to go wherever they go. There's over 25 tasty varieties that kids will love and that you can feel great about, too. Go-Go Squeeze fruit-on-the-go pouches. Find them in the applesauce aisle today. All right, you guys, how many of you are crying from Sonia and I recapping the days when we first met our babies? Oh, I love sharing those conversations with people, and I'm grateful that she led us into that world of their journey towards their baby boy. Also, friends, anyone relate to the liminal space illustration? If you have been in this time when you just aren't sure what's next, I loved that conversation we had. Sonia and her husband are so kind that we're going to give away a copy of their cookbooks to one of you over on my Instagram account. So check that out on Thursday, February 15th for your chance to win. Follow me at Jamie Ivy over on Instagram. Friends, today's show is edited by Chris with Pod Shaper, and the music was developed for the show by Matt Graham. Friends, enjoy your week. I hope you're going to get some happy hour live tickets. Share the show with a girlfriend and have a happy hour with a friend 